because this entire talk is about fitting technology around people. And so what we have to do here is fit the people around the technology. So thank you for working with me to make that point. So anyway, you get on the train and you whiz across to Wales. Um, you go past the capital, which is Cardiff. And then you end up in a place called Swansea. Now, South Africa, Cape Town, Stellenbosch, wonderful places, paradise. But Swansea is heaven. <laughs> Let me show you an image of Swansea to convince you of that. Look at that. Look at it. Who's coming? You're all welcome. So Swansea is a very old place. It was founded in, um, I think the, uh, the Vikings came there. It was called Swansegg a long time ago. But what it's really known for is that it was one of the beating hearts of the Industrial Revolution. And all those chimney stacks and smoke and dust, that was the refineries, the foundries, that took all of the copper in the world, processed it, and then sent it around the world to create infrastructures. So Swansea was a place of innovation. It was a place of building infrastructures that went out and changed the world. This is what it looks like today. And Swansea University has two campuses, and we're both campuses are way on the beach. Okay? So here is the foundry. Uh, if you've got very good eyesight, you might see me uh, on the top of the foundry controlling a drone that's taking the picture. Hands up if you can see that. See a little blob of me? Brilliant eyesight there at the back. Now the foundry is a building in a particular place, but it has a particular view about AI, machine learning, and computer science. And I'm now going to tell you a little bit about that. But before I do, here's a question for you. You've been here, some of you, for the last 10 days. You've had lots of technical and interesting discussions. I'd like you to turn to somebody sitting next to you. And this is an easy question. I sat in one yesterday, and I had to work out Shapley values. So here is a really easy question for you to answer. From where you sit or stand or think, what is the most important technology <coughs> of the future for you? So have a little think, turn to somebody, just answer it. What's the most important technology for you? Make some noise. If you don't want to answer the question, talk about what you're going to eat tonight and you know, where you're going to go touristing. Make some noise. Maybe say hello to somebody you haven't seen. Is there someone behind you or in front of you? What's the most important technology for you? Okay, okay, thank you very much. Nice to hear some conversations. Um, let's hear then. I'm going to point around. I've got very bad eyesight. Unless, oh, no. Oh, there's people. Hello. Um, I'm going to kind of like point randomly. And when I stop, my hand will be pointing at you. You will know it's you. You will feel my energy. And then you will answer the question. So what's the most important technology for you? The internet. Anyone else have the internet? Put your hands up if you said the internet. Oh, quite a few of you. That's a popular answer. Uh, what about you? You. Yes, you. Yes, you. Um, say it again. I'm going to be biased, but I'm going to say AI. AI. Anyone else think that AI is the most important technology of the future? Put your hand up if you agree. Okay, quite a few of you. And then one more. I'm going to be unbiased. We must have unbiased machine learning. Uh, what about you? Yeah. Uh, what was that? Oh, replicating, so a genetic bio thing. Yeah, okay. Does anyone else have a kind of, instead of a kind of like hard technology computer, does anyone have things like genetics, DNA, that kind of stuff? Yeah, quite a few. Brilliant answers. Now, because this is a masterclass in machine learning, um, I was encouraged by a colleague, of course, instead of to give my answer, simply ask chat GPT. And this is where you groan. Oh, God, not, not another slide using chat GPT. But bear with me. 
That's what ChatGPT said. And you've got some of the answers that you touched on there. Uh, the nice thing about ChatGPT, it's like a sort of banal therapist, isn't it? It doesn't want to upset you. It wants to make you feel like you've got a sort of good answer. And we'll come back to that later on in the talk. Things that you said and things that you didn't say. All right. What about us at the computational foundry? Uh, none of those things are the most important technology. AI is not the most important technology. This is the most important technology. This is where you go, ah. Do you want to try that? Ah. You see, you're not yet robots. You still have that empathy. And by the end of this talk, I'm going to revitalize you. Um, I was in Cairo last week, well, 10 days ago. Um, and this, I thought, is a miraculous vision, not just because Jesus is in the shot, if you can see, on the top left. But look at this lady. She was walking down the street. We'd just come out of doing some touristing. She's balancing some shopping on her head. She's got a shopping bag. She's using hands-free calling, if you look carefully. And, and she's got a crutch. Now, we are all technologists. We can get very seduced about the future of machine learning, AI, and robotics. Um, look at that. That is the most miraculous technology of them all. Now, the way you look at the world, what's important to you, will definitely drive how you create algorithms, how you gather the data, and so on. Have a look at that picture. It's a well-known um, illusion. Put your hands up if you see a rabbit. OK, hands down. Put your hands up if you see a duck. Look at that. There are more ducks in this room than rabbits. Woo! We're all different, aren't we? Slightly more difficult. Take a close look at that. Um, put your hand up if you see a person running away from you. OK? Put your hands up if you see a, a person running towards you. OK, fewer people. If you follow that link and you, and, you, and you Google these kind of things, scientists, so it must be right, tell us that if you see someone running away from you, then you have, whatever this means, a male brain, and therefore like to do things in serial processing. If you see a man running towards you, you have, whatever this means, a female brain, and you can multitask. Isn't it nice to put people into categories, you know, to kind of like think about how you categorize them, think about the features, and then put them into buckets and clusters? Oh, hang on. We do that in machine learning a bit. You must remember, that could be problematic and dangerous. Oh, now, I've put out a bit of paper in front of you all. And this is your first interactive activity. Um, this piece of paper is very important. And I want you to spend the next five minutes drawing for me a sketch of your ideal home in 10 years' time. Your ideal home. You can work together. Um, I'm going to come and wander around to help you. You do not have to be a great artist. I want you to really answer this. What do you want to live in in 10 years' time? For those of you who haven't done touristing yet, if you drive about 20 minutes that way, you can go and see where I took that picture of a lovely penguin colony and their manufactured home. So make some noise, draw a picture, um, do a sketch. This is a vital thing that will change how you think about machine learning. Five minutes, start now. What is your future home going to look like? Come on. Yeah, your ideal future home. What will it have in your home? Who will be in your home? Will there be electricity in your home? Try to think really seriously about this. It's hard because 10 years is a long time. Lots of our lives have changed dramatically in the last 10 years. There are many things none of us could predict over the last 10 years. 
But in an ideal world, what would your future home look like? Ah, the joys of being an academic is that this is one of my favorite things because it makes me remember exam halls and wandering around doing invigilation and watching people silently think, what is this question about? I have not done the revision for this question. Ooh, that's good. I like that. Try to think of what's inside your home, not just how it will look physically. What is inside your home? You don't have to draw every single element of your home if you don't want to. You could go to Dali and type it in. Someone doing that? No? Yes? Just one minute left. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> you are living in a void. <laughs> We're discussing yeah, what, what, would your, what would your ideal home have? Excellent. Perfect, yeah. Excellent. Sustainable. What objects would you have in there, do you think? What kind of things? Well, I was very minimalistic. Okay, minimalistic, right? So, basically, necessities. Okay, necessities, okay. Perfect, I might point at you. <laughs> All right. I promised the camera person I will go back to the front in a minute. Oh, perfect, uh, excellent. Technology is adapted around me. Okay, I've wandered around and lots of different ideas. That's important, isn't it? Just to remind ourselves of the richness and the diversity in this room alone. But let's see, um, I'm going to pick randomly on people again and this time I'm going to pick up your, your picture and look at it. Um, so, let's start with this one. This is called the Emperor's New Home, isn't it? Okay, do you want to say, um, what is your ideal home of the future? Um, it has to be sustainable, so very green, solar panels, yep. um, wasted water must be reused in some way, maybe gardens, um, and I guess it's a little smart home. So right, excellent. So sustainable, eco-friendly, with some smart home gadgety things. Now. Do you mind if I pick this yeah, one up? Yeah. So here's a oh, round of applause for that, please. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and then this one. I like this one because it's got lots of boxes. It looks very organised. So give me a sense of your life in ten years' time. Okay, so the, the, the also the sustainability, the smart home, no escom. <laughs> no escom. No escom. Okay, so it's going to be all solar or uh, yeah. Okay, wind and yeah, yeah. Curtains that opens itself, ah. a bed that can make itself. <gasps> a bed that can make itself. Anyone else have a bed that can make itself? No, it's okay. <laughs> you want a bed that can make itself. Anyone else now want a bed that can make itself? Better know that you're not in it though, right? Yeah. Okay, anything else? I guess then the big old things like library, gym, kitchen. And, and, and library, gym, kitchen. Thank you. Round of applause here as well. Do you want me to be on the podium? Okay. So I wonder though, um, could you just put your hands up if you had um, your best friend in the picture? Okay, excellent. Put your hand up if you had your family in the picture. Oh, that's nice, lots of you. Put your hands up if you had a dog or a cat or a spider. Ah, lovely, okay. There's still hope in this room, you haven't yet become robots. The most important things in your lives in 10 years' time, I can guarantee you, I can predict your future, will not be a gadget, will not be a mobile phone, will not be an AI algorithm, and will not be a robot that you can speak to. It'll be your flesh and blood, your friends, your family, your dogs, and your cats. And I would like to show you in the next 40 minutes, how and why. So we've got these three talks. My job is to, well, 
Do one of two things. When you leave this room, one of two things will have happened to you. One, you'll be really annoyed. You'll be provoked and cross. Uh, you'll be sitting there thinking, I spent an hour listening to this idiot, uh, and he doesn't know anything about AI. That is possible. That is one of my goals. So I can't lose, right? The second one is, you go away thinking, I wonder what a reorientation to human could do, not just in terms of applications. Of course, we take for granted that you're going to put your machine learning AI to do good in the world. Of course we are. I mean, unless, if, you're gonna, if you're sitting here to do bad, you should leave. But I'm and my colleagues are going to try and convince you that your fundamental algorithms, the way you collect data, the way you think about clustering, all of those things can be provoked and challenged by a people-first perspective. So I'm going to introduce it. Then Simon and Jen, um, who you put their hands up earlier, uh, after lunch are going to give you some methods to think about, to recruit into your research and practice. And then Thomas is going to perhaps show the you that it works. We've been working with colleagues in Langer uh, and Kalisha and Delft, and with colleagues in uh, Mumbai in big um, informal settlements to think about how we can disrupt AI for everyone. But we're going to start with um, human emotions. So as I say these words, I want you to feel these words, right? Okay, first one, shame. Despair. Ooh, these are powerfully horrible emotions. Failure. Things that we will all experience, right? Everyone in our lives have experienced this already, and we will in the future. Here's someone who definitely experienced that. Put your hands up if you know who this is. Yeah, lots of you. This is Lisa Dole, and he's playing um, Deep Mind's Alpha Go. And he's the grandmaster. He knows how to play this intrinsically cultured and deep historical game. And he lost against an AI. I don't know if you, after this talk, go and Google his press conference. He did several. But he sat with his head hung and he said, I'm really sorry. I'm ashamed. I felt so powerless. Now, for me, I started my career in machine learning, doing text generation, doing speech recognition. I never thought about human values. What I thought about was, I've got a data set from NIST on this, it was CD-ROM. My job is to get the most accurate speech recognition. I wish I had thought about it earlier. But that kind of reaction to a system that was built using some fantastic technologies that's a horrible emotion to generate in people. If you haven't come across this study, it's the Stanford AI 100-year study. Um, and the idea is that periodically, a group will come together, and they'll answer a set of questions and chart out over the next 100 years the future of AI. If you haven't come across it, go to the website. There's loads of resources to really get you thinking about grand challenges for machine learning and AI. Here are a couple of grand challenges in the most recent um, report. So there's the RoboCup. And the challenge to us as a community is that by 2050, we should build a robot team that can beat the FIFA World, human FIFA World Cup finalists. Robots that can win at football. A bit closer to home, there's also the grand challenge of the 2050 AI scientist. And the challenge is that by 2050, we're all out of a job. The Olympic motto, Citius Altus Fortis, that was about saying to humanity, let's strive to go faster, higher, stronger. Very positive push to humankind. Now, this will provoke you a bit. My view is there is too much in my world, your world, where instead of putting those values on humans, we're now saying, let's outpace, let's outsmart, 
Let's deceive. Let's deep fake. Let's do all of these things so that eventually machine learning, AI, robots, whatever you want to call it, are going to be better than we are. Right, another test for you. Here's a visualization. Uh, it's a very profound visualization of the world. Um, have a look at it. Turn to someone else, maybe behind you. What is that map visualizing? It's a data set, and it's trying to put across um, a distribution globally. So turn to somebody. What is that possibly about? Make some noise. Talk to somebody. Don't just sit there. What is the visualization? Okay, now the magic hand of fate is pointing at you, sir. What do you think it is? Uh, I was uh, talking about uh, about the age. Uh, oh, age. Yeah. Is it age? Okay, anyone else think about age distributions? Yeah, some people. Okay, here at the front, what do you think? What's it again? Birth rate. birth rate. Okay, anyone else have birth rate? Yeah, one or two. And then over here, what do you think? Yes? Um, access, to access to technology, internet. Put your hands up before that. Yeah, very common one. This is what it's actually about. Literacy rate by country. When I looked at this, the thing that strikes me is there are billions of natural intelligences, called us, which are underused, under-enabled, and under-equipped. And that seems a huge opportunity for us to build algorithms, to build data sets, to build new techniques to empower people, rather than trying to outpace and outsmart and outwit. So what we're going to do in the next uh, 20 minutes, and there'll be a um, load shed probably in the next minute or so, at which point my power will stop and I will freeze, at which point I'll start again in two minutes. Uh, because I am a robot, and that's going to be the punchline at the end of this talk, so watch carefully. Um, of course, being human, being a human being is very complicated. Well done, you're achieving it. It's a miracle. I'm going to focus on just a few characteristics of being human. Things are important to you and your family. Freedom's important. Agency's important. Being able to create is important. And being different is important. Let's have a look at each of those elements briefly. Um, I'll be giving you some, um, this is a class, so I'll be giving you some pointers to amazing, in my view, books. And here's the first one, right? Uh, ostensibly, Matt Crawford in this book is writing about his joy of driving. He loves cars, he tinkers with cars, he makes his own kind of engines, he just loves it. But actually, it's an allegory, a story about choices that you and I have. Two choices, really. One, to put technology in charge, or two, to release us in terms of our freedom and agency. So autonomous vehicles, of course, are the acme, the kind of like zenith at the moment of a agency that is removed from the driver and given to the car, right? And there's a huge amount of money has been spent on that. I'm just checking when my batteries will stop in about 15 seconds. Have a look at that image. As you look at it, what stands out to you? What jumps out to you? Classic image of an autonomous vehicle, right? Shout out your answers. His what? His eyes. His eyes. What is he doing? Ah, oh, yes. Oh, God, I never spotted that. Yeah, you can see his eyes in the mirror. Yeah, very good. Anything else? What stands out to you at the back? Yep. Trust. Trust. So he's like completely trusting this system, yeah? Okay, very good. Anything else over here? 
Yeah? Looking at screens. Actually, for me, the, the first thing is very related to that. He's looking at screens. There's one screen he's not looking at. What is that? The windscreen. Not looking out of the windscreen, and the world is passing him by. The second thing that strikes me about this image is it reminds me of this image. Put your hands up if you like the Wally -E film. You are human. Hooray! Wally. -E. Right. That's a, a good, I mean, Wally's an amazing prophetic film. If you're starting out machine learning, AI, or if you're a professor like me, watch that film at least once a year. That is a prophecy of a future we need to avoid. And in this particular case, these passengers are being driven around by autonomous mobility scooters, and at all the time, they're being made to become consumers, but also to become less and less human. Again, compare that with this picture. And Matt Crawford says, if you're building a car, the car should allow people to be not tracked, to take risk, to hit the open road, and let their soul sing. And so the choice that he gives you and I is, do you want to build technologies that look at humans and think they're not safe. There's too much risk. There's too much diversity. We need to box them in and take away that freedom. Or do you want to think about building technologies that make people's soul sing? Where do you sit? What about expression and creativity? So I'm talking about three areas of humanity. Um, like all of you, probably, you've, I've played around with DALI 2. So have a look at this lovely image. What was the text prompt that I put into DALI 2 to generate that image? What do you think I typed in? Come on, have a guess. Yoga practice on the beach. Say again, yoga practice on the beach. That could generate it. Any other ideas? You have an idea. What did I type in? Community. Community. Good idea. I typed in giving a summer school class on AI uh, by the beach. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is you. <laughs> then when I looked at it, I thought, no, I've got to be a bit more professional. Because if my colleagues think I'm giving a class by a beach and they see my slide or see this, they'll be cross. So I said, giving an AI class in South Africa in a professional manner. Are you ready? There we are, perfect. We are done. Now, when you look at anything that's generated from text or in any other way, um, put your hands up if you were in the talk on Monday. It was, I really enjoyed it and it was very profound and interesting when the banknotes were being animated. Do you remember that, the singing banknotes? Ooh, amazing, right? Very, on one level, creative. And in the previous talk but one, uh, we were shown, I think, the girl with the, the, the earring and expanding it out and drawing more of the picture. Brilliant in many ways. But let me tell you, however, I mean, these are rubbish, right, these pictures. However wonderful the picture, a future AI can make, however musical a future AI music machine can produce, however beautiful the dance of a robotic choreographed AI might be, it is meaningless. And I have scientific evidence to give you, or at least philosophical evidence. So here's Wittgenstein, uh, a famous philosopher, and uh, he came to Swansea. Um, I don't know why he came to Swansea, but he did come to Swansea. I wasn't there. I am old, but I'm not as old as Wittgenstein. And he profoundly wrote about what it is to be human. And in one of his essays, he said, if a lion could talk, we, we wouldn't understand it. So let's just try that. I'm going to be a lion. Ready? Ra! That woke someone up. Yeah. Ra! 
Now imagine now you could interpret that on a symbolic level and it made sense to you. Wittgenstein would argue that however compelling that was, it was meaningless because you and the lion share no experiences. Okay? The only way you and the lion can really engage creatively and expressively is if you are of the same material. Take a look at this picture. Um, in the UK, probably like in South Africa, there's a big worry that people like me are going to get old and there are not enough people to look after us. The AI answer is build a social robot. Social robot that will have conversations with me, creatively connect with me. Now remember what I said about how you see the world, you'll interpret an image. Stare at that image. Now, put your hand up if you see a laughing, happy gentleman. Oh, quite a few of you. Put your hand up if you see a horrified gentleman. Ooh, no one. And you are no longer human. Somebody in the back is thinking, what is this? No one, this is not going to happen to anyone in the future. But it is already. Put your hands up if you, and it's probably not you, someone you know. Put your hands up if someone you know, you went out for a meal with them, and instead of looking lovingly into your eyes, they look down on their phone. Put your hands up if you know someone like that. Yeah, shame on them. Oof. Glad you're not like that. What about when you're with your friends and your family, and there's little kids playing? Um, do you know any parents like this? Put your hands up if you do. Yeah, shame on them. We all do, don't we? Bit by bit, tap by tap, we're feeding into something. And bit by bit, we are being turned into something that can talk to a machine. And here is the huge danger, right? However wonderful our technologies seem to be, if we don't think carefully, we are not going to get things which can relate to us. We will be turned into things that relate, that they can relate to. Here's a book that you need to read if you need to think about that. It's by Jaron Lanier, a really kind of like um, visionary for many, many years. And what he says is AI, machine learning, recommendation systems, the feed you're getting, the clicks you're giving are all about turning you into a machine. And just like the Cyberman, the last thing that will be taken from you is your empathy. And if you don't believe that's happen, happening, then just think about all of the trolling and the darkness that you see on social media, where that empathy has been wrenched off of many, many people. On to the third thing, identity and diversity. So things are important to humans. We need to be in control. We need to have freedom. We need to express ourselves, and we need to be different. All of those things are under threat from the current trajectory of AI and machine learning. Now, if you've got your phone um, or another piece of technology and you flip it over, have a look at the back. It might not be on all of your phones or all on your devices. But you might well see something like this. This is an AirPod, isn't it? Designed in California. Designed in California. What a wonderful place California is. It is, like Swansea was way back then, the beating heart of the AI machine learning revolution. But it's not just one place. California is a global mindset. It's made up of people on the whole, like me, like you, who are on the whole affluent, on the whole well-educated, on the whole have grown up with technology. And that mindset is driving a great deal of innovation. But of course the world is much, much richer than that. Oh yeah, back to that survey. Uh, the Stanford AI 100 survey, one of the questions they ask regularly is, are you scared of AI in the future? Uh, most people say yes. In the, in the most current report, uh, people are no longer scared of robotic overlords. 
but they're scared of the more subtler undermining of democracy and of truth that is coming through, for example, their social media driven by machine learning and text generation. But some people aren't scared. And they tend to be white, they tend to be male, they tend to be affluent, and they tend to have experience with technology. The Californian mindset is not benefiting from a very diverse uh, look at the world. Here's the next book, which I would recommend if you want to think about this issue. It's called Beyond the Valley, and it makes the argument for thinking about how you innovate by looking around the world. Those of you who live in South Africa or in any part of Africa, you are in an amazing place to get disruptive, provocative, new ways of looking at the world. Not simply to make systems that fit into this world, but believe me, to make systems that change that Californian outlook and enriches it and diversifies it. Oh, back to human emotions. Feel them again. Shame, despair, failure, and reduction. I told you there were going to be two ways when we get to the end in about 15 minutes that you'll leave this room. You'll either think that's nonsense, or you'll think I need to think about how I change my outlook. So let me give you some hope. Here are some other human emotions. Joy, freedom, Hope. Those are things that I hope that we as a community will think about when you don't have to be building applications. When whatever you're doing in machine learning, that you'll be thinking that that's what I want to engender when my algorithms, data set, methodology, whatever it is, goes out into the world. So that natural intelligences are amplified. There's Lisa Dole again. We don't want that in the future. I'll show you what our group is focusing on now. This is the perspective that we are taking. We call it everyone virtuoso every day. Our drive is to create machine learning algorithms, data sets, interactions that can channel what you are as a human and make your soul sing. So if you've ever been to a concert, or put your hands up if you're a musician, Anyone can play instruments? Yeah. What about people who do things like rock climbing? Any rock climbers, surfers, bike? You know, things where you have an instrument, a bike, a musical instrument, a surfboard, and you can channel your physical, emotional, your spiritual being into that instrument and create a performance that enriches your life and of those around you. That's our perspective. Now, obviously, that's abstract. Um, we work, one of our collaborators is Microsoft Re Research, and we've been working on um, uh, data sets um, for impaired users. I want to show you now a video of one of the systems Microsoft, the people ends that we're building on, have built to give you a sense of what this virtuoso could actually mean in practice. Ooh. We need sound here. I hope you got the sense. So Elric, it's a really, go and read about the People Ends. It's a humbling and really inspiring project which Microsoft is, is building. And you saw Elric there, he was born blind, um, and he was using um, uh, the um, HoloLens and then some interesting algorithms. And he was able to choreograph and to be in charge of a shared play um, system, uh, um, uh, context. Amazing. That's what 
we mean by everyone virtuoso every day. Oh, my screen's gone again. Has the shedding of loading happened? Ah, perfect, perfect. Ooh, right, there we go. So, I talked too about how to ensure that there is more diversity in your design. And I'm not going to go into any detail really because in the talks after lunch and then tomorrow, Thomas, Jen and Simon will say more. But for 20 years in my case, and probably 10, 15 years in Thomas and Jen's and Simon's, we've come to places like Langer, Kalisha and Delft, uh, and to places like this, this is Dharavi in India, and to places here which are rural, um, very different to the Californian and the global perspective. And we have been blown away. We have seen things which have completely changed our outlook on computer science, on machine learning, and on AI. And let me just be clear, we're not going in there to provide a solution. We're not going in there as people who are experts or scientists. We go in there to be amazed as apprentices as we learn from the everyday experience of people who live very differently to, in my case, yeah? And I certainly encourage you to do that. So we often don't go in with any technological uh, agenda. We sit down, we have workshops, we talk to people who live in these places, we wander around their streets to see what's important and what isn't important. Um, we put prototypes and uh, Jen and Simon and Thomas will talk about this one, which is a, a box for speech interaction. Ooh, hang on, just go back. Everything that I've been talking about for the last almost hour is in the sub-discipline of something called human-computer interaction. Um, after lunch, Jen and Simon will be talking about these methods, but the main drive of all these methods is to say, you need to sit with people you need to ask them questions, you need to watch them, you need to build prototypes. And by prototypes, I don't just mean working systems. Thomas, or tomorrow we'll talk to you about prototypes, thinking about how we build data sets to drive automatic speech recognition. And you iterate, you iterate, you iterate. And you are guided by principles and experiments that have been carried out for 40 years. We already know lots of things that will work for people and things that don't work for people. So, we've come to the end of my talk. As we leave this room, there are two possibilities. Actually, now there are three. One is, you're asleep. Uh, I will ring a bell and you will wake up and have lunch. The second one is, you have been provoked and you don't agree with what I'm saying. That's a good response, okay? That's a good response. And the other one is, you've been provoked and you want to consider more how you can use these kind of perspectives in your own work. On your piece of paper, just for a minute in silence, can you turn over your paper and can you answer these two questions? At the end of this talk, you are either still focused on AI, and that's your main passion, or you are, well, I think human in the loops are important, or you want to radically disrupt your work. Okay? Answer that question. And then if you do want to radically disrupt your work, how might the things that you're hearing right now change your world? Just spend a quiet minute, turn it over, and then we will end. Now, uh, over lunch, uh, we're around, we can talk to you. Um, if you want to find out more about the work I've been talking about, but also with Simon and Jen, there's our URL. If I think I heard this morning that some of you were master's students, right? Um, and therefore, some of you might want to do a PhD. Uh, we have a PhD research center funded by the UK government, which is all people first. 
So we have people from computer science, from physics, from humanities, who all come together to try and drive fundamental AI research through the people lens. If you are interested, we have places which are fully funded for anyone from any place in the world. So we can take international students as well as people from the UK. If you want to do a PhD or you know somebody who might want to do a PhD, please send them that link peoplefirst.best. Uh, the applications are now open and we close them in March and then we have a selection process and we start in October. So those of you who've been sleeping, it's time to wake up. Those of you who've been listening, thank you very much. And for all of us, it's time for lunch. Thank you.